Hello everyone and welcome to episode 68. If you're a massive fan of Star Wars literature then strap in as we are joined by a very special guest. Yasu, which is Greek for hello, and welcome to episode 68. I am back from Greece. The people are happy that I have returned and left them with those horrible visions of me in my Speedos <laughs> and Mankini. And at last, joining me as always is my best pal in all the galaxy. It's Jimmy. How you doing, buddy? Howdy. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, how, was your, how was your trip, man? Needed. Very much yeah. it was hot, really, really hot. Um, nobody got sunburned, which is great. Uh, yeah. I pretty much just chilled by the pool. Obviously, I couldn't do a fat lot because my knee still isn't 100%. Um, yeah, just enjoyed the food, the people. I absolutely love Greece. Going back there hopefully next year to celebrate our 10th wedding anniversary. Nice. Um, but yeah, still managed to keep up with some of the news, some big news this week, uh, which we'll dive into later. What about you, mate? How's your week been? It's been good. Um, hectic. We're slowly kind of getting back into the groove of being in school. Like we've talked about yeah. off air, it's always kind of a punch in the face when you yeah. go from not being responsible to being responsible uh, for a lot of people and a lot of things. Um, but yeah, it's good to be back. It's good to get things going. Cross country has started. Um, it's been really hot here the last couple of days and it doesn't look like it's going to be given up, given in at all. But we did get to go out in my ghost, the VCX 100, this morning because it was nice. storming like crazy, lightning coming down, just nuts. And Molly and I have a ritual where we just hop in the Jeep and we go out the dirt roads and we drive out in it. Lightning coming down, it's so much fun. Um, nice. So that was a lot of fun and a great way to start the week off. So going to be a good week. Awesome. awesome. And everyone's favorite way to start the episode off is with Jimmy reading out a ton, and I mean a ton, of new explorers. So, Jimmy... Take it away. All right. Again, apologies up front. I'm not purposely trying to mess things up. Um, we got DLV, DLV 1604, Karina Whitmore, Outfox Motor, J Deliberio, TRB Podcast. Um, that's the, yeah, the rebel people. Uh, Jag Robbins, J J Jagor Robbins, uh, Mia Corkink, Star Wars Replicas, the Galactic Cantina 66. Jessica McNair, Indiana and Me, Brooke Downs 26, Star Wars Fangirl 1975, Owen Watson, Jedi Cat 1965, Alan Aurelia 2, Studios Books, Alicia Brenner, Greg the Leaks, Metallica Lorian, Metallica Lorian, um, Thera Corpit, no, the Rain Corpit. <laughs> we got him. <laughs> Sorry, the Rain Corpit. Stephen Karma, AJR Hobby, Jeffrey Eldridge, Christopher Lit Cortex, R2 Detour Bros, and Dan Deck. And again, apologies for making you listen to that. Awesome jobs. Remember to like this episode, share it with your Star Wars friends and family. Follow us on all social media platforms at Explore the Force. And if you're watching on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and help us grow this magnificent community that we are growing on our social media platforms. So, as always then, it's that time for our Force Encounters. Okay, so this week I'm gonna start us off. I managed to get part way through another Star Wars book, a certain point of view, Empire Strikes Back version. Uh, and it's really caught me off guard because I didn't actually realize or not realize, but take into account the thoughts and feelings of the Tontons in the movie, The Empire Strikes Back. And there's a few short stories in this uh, that express their feelings and emotions. Um, real, real fun. Uh, and my last Force encounter is the lack of Star Wars in Greece. I went on the hunt everywhere, talking to people, Greek people. Uh, that was serving my drinks and food if they'd heard of star wars before and you know if they're a fan of it 
And there isn't really many Star Wars fans or even people that have heard of Star Wars in Greece, which absolutely blew my mind. Um, but we're hoping to get some uh, Greek followers. <laughs> so we'll see if they start flooding in. How about you, Jimmy? Yeah, uh, more of the same as far as, um, you know, just connecting with kids and students. We're talking with Eric, um, you know, one of our listeners and fellow teacher about maybe kickstarting the uh, scruffy looking Nerf Herder Star Wars Club back up at the high school. So, well, you know, hopefully we'll do that. Um, and then Friday night, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, uh, Molly and I got out the, you know, it was a long week at work, our first full week back to school, kind of like not feeling about doing a whole lot of stuff. So um, we got out to Republic Gunship Lego. It hasn't been built yet. And I, she would do a bag. I would do a bag. And we're going to finish up. Uh, I know we record on Sundays. We finish up uh, this evening and then I'll take it to school and put it on my shelf. But we had a nice little Lego Star Wars weekend. Um, and yeah. And then, of course, uh, you know, me and my buddy Mike, we've been doing the uh, I think we're going on number four this week will be tonight when you're listening to this it'll actually come out tonight will be jedi and the mailman and i think unless something breaks between the time we recorded this and the tuesday we'll be talking about our favorite non-essential star wars characters so just kind of a little list of people that we want to talk about and uh maybe we feel it deserves a little bit more so yeah lots of good star wars stuff in my life and i'm excited awesome. for it and i'm glad to have you back so <laughs> it's always good i need you back good at the helm back. Good, good good to be back buddy good to be back okay so uh, let's head over to batu then and see what news we've got coming out of there all right well the big news sad news for some joyous news for others um Star Wars The Acolyte canceled after one season. Actor Lee Jung Jae has shared his reaction to the cancellation of The Acolyte, saying, To hear the news, I was quite surprised personally as well. As you know, my character had died already in the first season, says Lee, so I wouldn't have appeared in the second season if there was one anyways. But personally speaking, I really love Leslie's writing. I thought that she was a great writer and director who was very talented in the storytelling, as well as creating characters and creating meaningful structures within the story. So I was actually personally really looking forward to watching season two with her at the helm. Um, uh, Mike and I last week, we did a full breakdown. Yeah. Um, Jack, how, how are you feeling about this news? Shocked. I was actually really, really shocked. The fact that they announced it so quickly as well. Uh, the fact that there's things or entire things missing off the Disney store from the acolytes, it's like they're trying to just purge it and get rid of it completely. Um, it's sort of letting i'm gonna say the haters or the trolls not not win um but they've definitely been heard which is a little bit disappointing uh and it does concern me a little bit because we are in a age now where you know if tv doesn't grab you within the first five or six minutes it's just instantly deemed as rubbish whereas back in the day you know you were waiting sometimes a week two weeks for the next episode um i just think people are we a bit too greedy you know, is too much Star Wars a bad thing? We spoke about it before. I think at this point in time, I, I really do think it is. And I think we should have a bit of a break, if I'm honest, a bit of a, a reset. Yeah. Um, you know, we reacted to the news pretty quickly. I still, I don't know why I'm still holding out hope because Disney's not come out and said anything. Yeah. They're not going to, if they're not going to do it. You know, and honestly, they never promised us a season two. They said this was a one and done, but it had the potential for more seasons. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we talked about that a little bit on the show. And then I, you know, I listened to different podcasts and I listened to the Four Center podcast with Ken Knapsack, Joseph Scrimshaw, and Jennifer Landa. And she is Hispanic. And she, in her, they, they reacted to this news as well. And she, I mean, Mike listened to it, told me I needed to listen to it quickly. This is after we did our show and yeah. the acolyte was more than just a TV show for people. I mean, there was a lot of people and she talks about not seeing herself represented in star Wars, even though she's a massive fan. Like if you look up her wedding, Jennifer Orlando's wedding was all star Wars. I mean, this is before it was like, you know, real classic stuff, but she talks about it and they bring up a lot of good things that like Mike and I didn't necessarily touch on, but we also, Mike and I are both white dudes who don't, you know, we don't have some of the discriminations and things like that that some yeah, people yeah. deal with. Um, so in that aspect, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to see the show go. Like we've said all along though, it wasn't perfect. It definitely had potential. Um, but yeah, it's a little, it's a little, I'm a little bummed out still. 
at the yeah. news. It does it does feel like the people who were screaming about it in the not a very nice way did kind of win. So which I I you know I've I've gone on the air saying multiple times I didn't think Disney or Kennedy would back down. I think they would I thought they would go with season two just to stick it to um stick it to those people, but it is a business. They need to make money and if the reports are true it, it wasn't getting the views and so you know we'll see. I'm still not counting it out. I still don't think like yeah. go to Japan and they could say, all right, the adventures of or you know the what's next after Acolyte, the apprentice. You know what I mean? Like how it could be the Acolyte, could be the apprentice, and it could be the master or something. You know, just great shout. Who knows? We'll see. Who knows? And it leads us nicely into the next piece of news where Lucasfilm reportedly have multiple oh. unannounced Star Wars TV shows <laughs> in development. Jeff Snyder of the Insider. In Schneider, should I say, has revealed that Lucasfilm at this time has several new shows that simply haven't been announced but are in development. So they could be The Apprentice, they could be The Master. How awesome would that be? Uh, but yeah, like it says there, there's no names, no nothing, no details. It's just, you know, multiple unannounced in development. In development could mean anything as well. It could be in the very, very, very early stages. So, you know, I employ everyone, Star Wars fan, including myself, calm down. Don't get yeah. too excited just yet. Let's just see what happens. We do get ourselves wound up quite easily. But um, Jeff Snyder also dropped that uh, on the insider doc, on the insider Snyder.com, Kathleen Kennedy is expected to remain as Lucas president until at least quarter two of next year. Quarter two being the months that run from April 1st to June 30th. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't know how I feel. I mean, she's given us a lot. I haven't loved all of it. But she's made Disney a lot of money. Yep. So I, you know, I know people are calling for her head. I, I personally, I feel like she might have an agenda. I don't think what she, what she wants to bring into Star Wars is wrong at all. Sometimes I just feel like she slammed us over the head with it. Like she should have paced herself out and could have brought and brought everyone into Star Wars. Like Star Wars is for everyone. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, she won't be fired unless the business does it poorly. So we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I've got no. I'm not bothered about it whatsoever. I'm honest, she, it doesn't affect me. <laughs> She's doing a, a, a okay job. Okay yeah. Job. No, I mean you can't 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 fault. I mean the no, billions exactly. of dollars she's made for Disney. Yeah. She's I mean successful. everything you don't like, the stuff you do like, she's responsible for all of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and coming to Disney Plus, I think it's in November off the top of my head, is a documentary about the music by john williams can't wait to play that bad boy full blast that will be amazing that, that is going to be incredible you're looking forward to that jimmy oh yeah i've been really um i almost got to do you know how they do that sometimes where they'll play they'll play star wars movie but they'll have a live orchestra i really really want to experience that someday That's what this was. um yeah and we had one in pittsburgh while we we're back in pennsylvania Unreal. we were camp. I just I can't imagine Unreal. that music gives me goosebumps on yeah. crappy speakers of my TV. I cannot imagine what it would be like to oh, hear it. And then so just good. you think about like John Williams, he wrote the music for the Olympics. Harry, I mean, <laughs> just the stuff that he's done. You know, I think was it in the Force Awakens, oh, not Force Awakens, the um the Rise of Skywalker when he plays the uh you know the bartender. Yeah. Behind him are 63 different objects. For all the like the Academy Award nominations or wins that he's received throughout his, I mean, career, it's just, it's, really you know, we have a very talented person come on. Just the creativity of these people and the understand. Like, I I don't understand music. You know, I don't know how to create it. I I, hey, I like that. That sounds good. You know, yeah. but just to be able to pull that from your mind from paper, it's just it's mind boggling. Of course, John Williams. He is getting up there in age, so I'm glad that they're doing this for him. Um, just may, may probably the greatest of all time as far as it, when it comes to that. Easy. I mean, I Easy. feel like anyone who's inspired to become, you know, write music for movies has to be a John Williams yeah. fan. So, yeah, one hundred percent. And that wraps up this week's news. So, joining us today is a guest who has written in Star Wars canon. In 2020, this person wrote the short story Right Hand Man in the book from a certain point of view, The Empire Strikes Back. Also wrote the masterpiece and personal favourite of mine, 
Catalyst in the Horror Public series and the short story The Call of Coruscant in the Horror Public Tales of Light and Life. And also wrote short stories for the High Republic Tales from the Occlusion Zone, published in Star Wars Insider magazine. And if that's not enough, he's also a practicing physician and doctor and an associate professor of internal medicine. Fellow listeners, it's not Dr. Alpha or Dr. Perishin. It's Dr. Lydia Kang. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank Hello, you guys Lydia. for having me. Hi, how are you guys doing? Yeah, really, really good. Thank you so much for joining us on today's show. We super appreciate you taking the time. Obviously, you're super, super busy uh, <laughs> doing what you do. There's so many hidden talents that you've got. Again, just doing all the research before the show, all that, just incredible. The stuff that you're doing is unreal. It's, uh, yeah, it definitely keeps me busy. That's for sure. Keeps me on my toes. But uh, <laughs> happy to talk about all of it because it's it's been quite a whirlwind the last couple of years. Awesome, yeah. I we just we're saying off air before you got in here. Uh, funny story. When I was reading your book Cataclysm, I was finishing it up and I'm sitting in my uh, sitting in our living room reading, and my wife's like, "What's wrong with you?" I'm like, I'm freaking <laughs> out, man. And she's like, "What's wrong?" I'm like, "Everyone's dying." <laughs> and, um, and so, and I, you know, you had all the you had all the nameless running around, and I was, I mean, I was like sweating I, I don't remember the last time like i read a book that made had that effect on me and it was awesome and i think i reached out to you as soon as i finished that i was like man we've got to <laughs> so yeah. super excited i know marie's a huge fan as well um so, <laughs> but, well that yeah. is a huge compliment i have to say because the 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 last thing that you ever want to hear was that like it was good you know no, didn't set the pulse racing at all or had no emotional investment so that is awesome to hear oh yeah the, phenomenal i mean just i just, i got on the air afterwards that with jack and uh was talking to him about it as well and he just started laughing because he hadn't read it yet i'm like dude i can't spoil it for you but yeah. i think i sent him my copy overseas because he said he couldn't find it or something so oh, i shipped yeah. it over to him as fast as i could <laughs> i wanted him to read your book so big fans here um but yeah, so we wanted to just, you know, talk about that, talk about you, because you are a really impressive person, obviously, with everything that you do, you know, that Jack just read off. But we'd like to start off with how did you, how did you get into Star Wars? Like, you know, what about Star Wars pulled you and you said, I want to I want to be a part of this world. Um, how did that start for you as a, as a child or whatever, you know, your fandom for Star Wars? Oh, God. Well, as a as a kid, I. Um... Uh, I'm actually old enough to be able to say, like, I saw, um, you know, the original Star Wars trilogy in the theater when they first came out. So I was um, six years old when I saw the first movie. And, um, you know, I was just a kid and I was like, this is such a weird movie and so interesting. And after that, watched all the other ones and watched them. I have lost track of the number of times that I watched the original trilogy. It was just such a embedded part of my my childhood and loved so much of you know that world and then when the prequels came out loved those too i was just we were so excited you know to have those come out to see some of these incredible fight scenes to actually see sith it was incredible so i became a doctor and then i became a writer and the whole time that i was publishing early on i was publishing young adult and then i got into like nonfiction writing. And then I got into like adult historical novels and stuff like that. Like it never occurred to me at all. Like I could write for Star Wars. So I didn't, I didn't have it on my sort of to-do list or like my hopes and dreams. Cause it was just so not part of my, I, I just didn't think it was like for someone like me. I just, I don't know, just didn't even enter. It's sort of what somebody said to you, like, would you like to walk on the moon someday? And you're like, I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> like, <laughs> Okay. Sure. So, um, so yeah, so when it happened to me, it was offered to me and that's, that's how it all happened. I didn't seek it out. Cause again, like didn't know it was a, a possibility. So that was just an incredible, um, opportunity that was just kind of sent to me via my, my agent. Well, you have an amazing agent then. So <laughs> more thankful for it. So as a doctor, how did you get into writing like young adult fiction and all of the stuff that you've written? So um, I I was mentioning to everybody that I um, 
moved to Omaha, Nebraska about 18 years ago. So I had been living in New York City for a long time. That's where I did like med school and my training and everything. And then moved to Omaha. I had a third kid and I was working part time as a physician um, seeing patients. And I, I just couldn't um, help but feel like I, there was just something else that I wanted to do creatively. And so I started getting into writing and it started with like essays about um, patient care because apparently you can publish essays and poetry in medical journals because they usually have like a humanity section or a section for creative writing. So I did that and I got published a couple times. And then um, I kind of woke up one day and was like, I would like to try to write a young adult novel because I was reading a lot of YA and this was in the in the aughts. So it was huge. There was this giant like, you know, um, wave of like kind of dystopian young adult novels. And I really love them. I just had so much. I was having a blast with those. And and I decided I would give it a try because I read somewhere that like you could actually become a published author without having to go back to school and for three years and like, you know, get a master, an MFA or all that kind of stuff. And I was like, all right, I'm going to try to teach myself how to do this and I'll, I'll give it a shot. And it took a couple of tries because I had to write several books. I'm sorry. My dogs are barking. Apologies. Uh, <laughs> um, I have mom to the list. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so I started publishing in young adult. I, my first publisher was Penguin. Um, and it was a science fiction novel. And then there was a sequel to that. And then I started to, I really just started to branch out into writing a lot of different things. Um, but it kind of happened just because I sort of like, I just, I kind of wanted to, I, I had wanted to write something since I was a kid, but I didn't think I was good at it. And I didn't try very hard. And I kept getting all these signals from people like, hey, you're good at science, you're good at medicine, like stay in your lane and just do that. And leave the writing to like, you know, the creative people who were destined to do that. And I, I think I finally gave myself permission to do this when I was like, basically like 37 years old. I was like, I'm going to start, I'm going to start writing. I'm just going to try. And if I fail, I fail, but at least I don't have to like, you know, it's not as um, kind of out there and in front of everybody, you can very quietly fail when it comes to writing, you know? So I was like, I didn't feel too embarrassed by giving it a shot. My husband, um, is, is like a, you know, super supportive and he was like, yeah, go for it. Why not? Like, let's do it. So I, I had a lot of internal support, I think for my family to give it a go. And I was also, I just wanted really hard, try, I wanted to try really hard to be a better writer. So I didn't take feedback at its face value and just sort of lick my wounds and stop trying. It just made me try harder. So I think that helped a lot. Did you find like a, a good editor kind of early on that would help you through stuff? Or did you feel like you had like a mentor in the process? I don't, I didn't really have a mentor. There were just a lot of different people that entered my life. Um, like I was in a writing workshop for a little while, which was really helpful. I um, found, um, beta readers. And so I found other writers who were also trying to get published and we would exchange manuscripts and give each other feedback. And we were like, you know, we were pretty harsh with each other. We were like, in order for this to be on a shelf, like you got to fix this whole problem. This is all very amateur. You need to be better. And, and I would look up how to fix things. I would look up world building and how to create good characters and how to, um, you know, create stories that had a lot of depth. And I, my textbooks, were books. I just read a lot. And I was like, I want to be a really great writer. Like, you know, Jennifer Donnelly, I really want to write something as exciting as the Hunger Games. And how does she make that book? So like every single page, you're just constantly turning it, trying to figure out what's going to happen next. Like these were my textbooks. And so that's, that's kind of how I learned. Oh, that's so fun. Well, I was, uh, was going to ask you then, when, when did you decide that you wanted to pursue uh, writing as a career. So do you say it was at the age of 37? What yeah. Was it that just, what, what was it that just sparks that interest? Or, you know, you just woke up and go, yeah, I think today, you know, I've done the mothering thing. I've got kids, I've got dogs, I've walked on the moon, I've done the doctor <laughs> thing. <laughs> we'll try writing. Or is it just a case of you roll the dice and go, right, number two, what's that one on my chart? Right, write it. I, you know what? I don't know if I can really put my finger on it. I just knew at some point in time I thought, this might be possible and it might be within my reach if I do this the right way, if I try yeah. hard enough. And I was really, I didn't know for sure it was going to happen. And I obviously was, I was pretty nervous about it because the, the interesting thing is that it's actually 
the, the pathway to becoming a doctor is really straightforward. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's laid out for you. It's like, you got to get these grades in school. You got to have the right extracurriculars and you apply and you take the MCAT. And if you do well on that, then you go to med school and you study real hard and then you go to residency. So there's, it's just like a, a really laid out path. You just follow the path and try to do it yeah. well. But with writing, it was like, there was no obvious path. It could have been, maybe I went to school for it. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I self-taught. Maybe I didn't. Some people had an agent. Some people didn't. Some people self-published. Some people didn't. It was all over the place. And so I just had to decide, I think this is how I want to do it. And I'm going to try. And I'm going to probably fail. And I failed a lot. I mean, my God, I have so many rejections from agents, you know, well over a hundred rejections. And that was really painful. But um, for some reason, it didn't because I knew it was really common for that to happen. It didn't yeah. prevent me from trying harder. I just kept saying, well, then this isn't the right story. I'm, I'm still not good enough. I will try harder with my next book. And um, I think with my third one, I remember one of my friends read it and she was like, this is it. She's like, you did it. She's like, the other ones were, were OK. She's like, this one. This one should be on the shelf at Barnes and Noble. And I was like, oh, OK, I think I maybe did something here. And that's that was my first book. My first book, it was called Control. So wow. awesome. obviously you became a writer, but didn't stop being a doctor. What's that like kind of juggling both? Um, it's been interesting. I, the fact that I'm part time as a physician makes a huge difference. It, people are always like, I don't understand how you do it. And there are a lot of um, authors out there that are full time physicians um, and they they somehow manage it and, and juggle everything. But I um, I'm part time and I do primary care internal medicine. So I see patients and I take care of their diabetes and their high blood pressure and cancer screenings and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it is um, a smaller chunk of my week so I can spend the rest of my week writing. And that is what has worked out really well for me. Um, why did I not quit <laughs> being a doctor? I probably haven't burned out as much because I am part time to be completely frank. And then also the second thing is that um, it, when, I, when I got my first book deal, I had a bunch of uh, friends of mine that are all you know doctors and they were like, so you're going to quit right? Like you're going to retire as a physician, just like, like that was their dream. They were like, oh my God, why would you keep doing this if you could write books? And I wasn't as unhappy, I guess, as they were. And somehow they have managed to balance things out for me. They have completely different stressors and they, um, they sort of ground me in different ways and also provide an escape um, from each other. So, so far it's working. I can't say that I'm going to be a physician forever or that I'm not going to at some point in time, give it up to become a full-time writer. But at the moment, the balance is still working. And as long as it does, I'll, I'll probably keep going this way. Very cool. You feel like a little less pressure because we've had other authors on, we had Kavan on things like, you know, full-time and I've listened to, um, why Thrawn, who created Thrawn? I cannot even think of the person's name. I'm blanking. Right Timothy Zahn. Timothy yeah. Zahn. Yeah. He talks about how he just, you know, he just went for it. But the pressures of trying to like, I got to sell this next book or do you feel those kind of pressures or is it kind of like a little bit because you do have that balance, you can be like, well, if this doesn't work, I can just kind of, I can lean back into medicine or if I really take off, you know, I can keep writing for whatever. I mean, does it, you feel like that makes it a little bit easier for you or is it more because you just spread out, like you think that that balance. So there are like two questions that you're asking. So one is sort of like there's financial stability and the other question, the other thing is um, ambition, right? So yeah. I have more financial stability having this job for sure. I have financial stability because I have a working full-time spouse. And so that makes a huge difference. Um, but my income stream now is like in a place where I'm fairly comfortable. So it's it's worked out, which I'm really happy about. The interesting thing about um, ambition, though, is that in the practice of medicine, I have never been very ambitious. Like I, I knew I wanted to take care of patients, but I am not the kind of person who wanted to really climb the medical academic corporate ladder. Like I had no interest in being like a full professor and like trying to get this like crazy promotions and doing all these other things that are required to get to that promotional level. I am very happy being a worker bee. I'm very happy where I go to work 
I take care of people, I have great conversations with my patients. We catch up on each other's lives and I send them out to the door, hopefully in a better state than when they first came in. That gives me a lot of happiness. All the other stuff like, you know, um, arranging this and like, you know, creating curriculums or, um, you know, running these like gigantic meetings and stuff. And um, I mean, I teach medical students and stuff like that, but I don't want to be in charge of teaching medical students. That doesn't really get me excited. So because of that, my ambition within the realm of medicine is very focused on patient care. Um, when I started writing, my ambition was like completely off the charts. It was very different. It was like, well, now I want to write this and now I want to write this. And I, I'm never, I'm never, never short of a story that I just want to put on the page. And as soon as I get one down, there's always, an, there are other stories just lurking in the back, just sort of like waiting to, to be written. And I, that, that is a, an excitement that I don't experience in medicine. It's just completely different. This creative like urge to be like, let's do another book. And I can't wait to get this book into the hands of readers. And, oh, I hope this, I hope they really like it. And I hope I, I, you know, do a really good job making this a high quality story that they feel emotionally invested in. So that gets me very, very excited. So they're like, I said, they're just different careers, yeah. different energies, I guess, you know? Oh yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's just crazy to hear someone like, you know, like you, Becoming a doctor is obviously not easy. I mean, it's well documented and things like that. I mean, I had the funny joke about, you know, is anything like scrubs, but um, <laughs> how difficult it is to become a doctor and then to hear your passion about writing something that you just kind of, you know, it's, it's pretty awesome that you found it and, you, and you're great at both. So very cool. Yeah, I feel I feel pretty lucky. And there are actually a lot of people who work in the medical system who have these creative lives and sometimes they're secret and sometimes they're not so secret. And I think it's just a really great thing for everybody to to have to have something to lean back on creative that is just not like your day job where you can sort of stretch out in different ways that you can't in your in your and what brings home the paycheck, you know. As a teacher, I fully agree. <laughs> yeah, I can say I'm a I'm a psych professor, and I also make costumes on the side. So having that, you creation. are. I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. Oh my I'm gosh! Really so sure. you were you were totally doing a very similar thing because you have like yes. that whole academic sort of um, construct around you and yeah. teaching and all that kind of I'm, stuff. But then... I'm I'm with you on like I like having my my thing. I have my students and my classes, and I don't want more than that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm I'm perfectly happy with it, and I and I applaud the people who are able to do more and make institutions run and make them better and makes like education, like medical education, better. I applaud them. I can't. It's not in me to do that. Nice. I'm at the complete other end of the spectrum of all three of you there. Then <laughs> I'm in the British Army. So. <laughs> oh, wow. That's so funny. And then here you are immersing yourself in another, in a world that has like a very heavy militaristic kind of yeah. construct yeah, yeah. in it. Yeah, this is, this is my getaway. Yeah, this is one of the things that Jack and I bonded on. I, I served our country in the infantry for a few years out of high school. So wow, thank you know, you. that's kind of how Jack and I met through and then we bonded over those kinds of things. But it sounds like you've had an amazing journey. Um, you know, we kind of turned towards Star Wars a little bit. Is there a favorite, you know, when you're writing these characters and you've done a lot. So you've got Cataclysm, you've had the short stories in the Insider magazine, and you've created characters for the Tales of Light and Life. Do you have a favorite that's that you've written or is there someone like, I'm sure, I'm assuming that you've read, you know, you read the High Republic, you got, you know, do you have a, a favorite character of yours that you've written? Let's just start there, I guess. Do you have a favorite mm -hmm. character that you've written? Um... I, in Cataclysm, I had a handful that I loved, maybe a little bit more than others. And I think I, I enjoyed um, writing Kyung Greylark, um, the chan one of the chancellors. I had so much fun really doing a deep dive into her life and watching it turn around um, throughout the, the book. Love that. I really loved writing um, about the youngling, Sipatarko. She is one of my favorites. She's so naughty. And she is like, um, I could never like do what Master Yaddle did and take care of her because she was just 
I was like, I felt like I was trying to have to have, have, have to like pin her down on the page and be like, stop, stop doing that. Stop doing that too. So fun. Stop doing this. And um, yeah, she wrote herself. That was just, it's just a joy, joy to do. Um, in the Star Wars short stories, um, it's been fun putting together this sort of ragtag crew of different people. And so I've enjoyed um, creating them. I mean, Jocelyn, Pika, Adrian, they, existed before, you know, um, in some of the short stories that had come during wave one. And so I got to pick, take them and then sort of run with them. And that was really lovely. Um, it's really interesting when you pick up characters that were previously written by other people, and then yeah. you have to um, sort of shepherd them through another set of problems <laughs> and stories, <laughs> um, because you have to be really careful about what's their personality like and what are they like, but you are you have to stay true to your voice and how you're going to work with those characters. And so that was really interesting and fun to do. It was really fun to do that with like, say, like Gela and Axel, because in Convergence, they were just doing their own thing and they were just so just jumping off the page and I had to take them and just keep going with it and <laughs> stay true to them, but also throw a couple twists their way. So. It's it's been a, a lot of fun, but I do definitely have a couple of those favorites. Mastery at all for sure. Mm. One of my absolute favorites writing. I am so glad that I got to do that. I totally shoved her in there. <laughs> and they let me, and I was like, yes, excellent. That, yeah, that's I mean, because you've written. I mean, we've all these different things. You took this character that we see for like what five seconds in the the prequel movies, and we've got to see her yeah. before Tales of the Jedi. We had seen nothing of her, you know, and you get to bring her to life it's got to be awesome for you like a like very experienced to bring a character with that much mystery around her to life yes with. yeah yeah I, I love doing that it was really not lovely to sort of like embrace who she was and sort of like let her because I you know she's not going to be just a female Yoda she's going to be her own and you know sort of yeah. person and I, and I knew she had this sort of like kind of dry sense of humor and she had a certain level of patience because she was always working with younglings. And so I, I wanted to really um, see how she did in that situation. But I also wanted like I wanted people to see how like completely badass she could be because we all know. Oh, yeah. Like Yoda, when he's like when he's pushed and when he is, you know, um, when he's fighting and he really brings everything out like full stop, like just he he's incredible. And I wanted I wanted that for Yaddle as well. And so I was really excited to have her be in that and um, that book and be able to like sort of take it to the end and see how she did. That was fun. Loved it. Yeah. Yeah. You, de you definitely did that for me. I had the same sort of feeling when I first seen Yoda on Attack of the Clones, where you first see you think, well, something's going to go down here. I had that feeling with Yaddle. And I completely agree as well that you did a fantastic job of giving Yaddle making her her own person rather than just being like you said another yoda i, I didn't really feel that it wasn't just another yoda it, it did feel to me that you know yada was her own person yeah and then i'll tell you a little secret about that because i wasn't sure if i was going to be able to use her or not and so i had written her into the book and um i got the feedback from like editors and everybody and they were like you may put more yaddle in and i was like yeah so i actually expanded her storyline and had her do a lot more and have her be a, a little bit more of a main character instead of like a side character um because i uh, because people were like yes this is great like keep going with that and and i got to so that was awesome but being being drawn into Star Wars and being able to do that is so exciting. Get, getting the permission to like play with characters. That... Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I know because you know, there are parameters that we have to work it work within. Um, that being said, we still have a huge amount of um, leeway with writing the stories, yeah. you know, um, I get a lot of questions about like, you know, how, like how much, how much leeway do you have? Like, is there, you know, it's, it's everything sort of already figured out and you're just like sort of ghostwriting the whole thing. And it, it's, it's anything but that it's so a lot. So when you read, you know, a star Wars book, you know, that author is the author. They're not just sort of ghosting this thing that someone that like, you know, Lucasfilm or story group has been like, write this, write the story for us. Like that, it, that's not how it worked. Okay. It, so, and I love that because then you really get 
a feeling. And I think you probably do when you read these novels, you'll be like, oh, this is a Kevin Scott novel. Like this is his <laughs> voice. This yeah. is what Charles, you know, Soul does like this and, and Claudia Gray, like they all have a particular way of writing and, and voice yeah, and stuff different like that. Styles. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you've been, you know, brought into the Star Wars universe, I'm sure you get to go to all kinds of, you know, conventions and things. Do you have a favorite fan experience that has happened since starting the team? <laughs> For sure. Um, Star Wars Celebration when it was in London. Oh, it was awesome. my first celebration. And I'm it oh, was it really? I went to yeah, yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. It was so it was so cool to see so many people like cosplaying like High Republic stuff, Marie seeing you there and all. Oh my God, it was so cool, it was so cool. But um, one, it was my first Star Wars celebration. And then two, it was also like three days after Cataclysm released. So it was like, I my plane landed in like Heathrow and my book released like, <laughs> like while I was over the Atlantic Ocean. And so I landed, I'm like, it's out. And I like, I basically landed, I got to my, the place where I was staying and I like ran to a nearby park with my book. And I was like, my book is out today. I was like so excited. I was so jet lagged, I was so tired. I probably had these like huge bags under my eyes, but it was so cool. So I, I think probably there won't be another experience that is just like that. Cause it was so incredible. Um, but I hope there will be more in the future. So I'm looking forward to, to you know, other other experiences as well. So we'll see. That's amazing. That, that's what I love about Celebration. A year ago, or just over a year ago, I, was, I met Jimmy at Star Wars Celebration in London. Obviously, Lydia, oh, you nice. was there. And Marie, we've only just started to get them. When did we first uh, meet you? About? Yeah, over the uh, summer for Acolyte stuff. Yeah. We, we've been... Yeah, so just before that, so, you know, it's all come to this point now. And funnily enough, at one point, we're all in the same room. <laughs> For the same reason. That's so cool. I know that's, and that's, that was like really, really neat. Like I saw people, like I saw like a fan or two from like Omaha, Nebraska that were like now in London and they were like, hi. And I'm like, yeah, we just did the same flight. That's incredible. Um, but just to see people that had been really friendly with me on like, you know, Twitter and, um, Instagram and stuff like that. And then to see them in person, it was like, it was like so cool. Awesome. It was incredible. Nice. Um, you sort of already spoke about it and we asked Calvin pretty much the same same question. But what we'd like to know as well is, what was your process like getting selected for Project Luminous or getting selected to do the, uh, the High Republic stuff? Oh, um, it's not terribly interesting. They reached <laughs> out to, so I had um, written, the short story in the, from a certain point of view, the empire strikes back. So I had written that short story. Yeah. And, and they had, again, the first, when that had happened, they had reached out through my agent and been like, would you like to write a short story? And I eventually I said, yes, but it took a while for me to get there. Cause I was like terrified, just <laughs> terrified to do it. And then, um, that was out for like, I guess a year or so. And then, um, they contacted me through my agent again. And they said, would you like to write for, the high Republic, but this would be like phase two. And I did exactly the same thing I did the first time, which was panic and think <laughs> I, I couldn't do it. And this is cause I was like, well, you know, short story, that's one thing, but like an entire, like adult, like full length novel yeah. is, is another. And, um, so I eventually, I eventually did say yes. And everybody in project luminous was incredibly, just welcoming and they were like you're gonna have a gazillion questions just like ask us all the questions and 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 it wasn't just me you know because this george mann was coming on and zoraida and um tessa gratton were all coming on and so we all sort of like i, I didn't feel like i was alone in sort of entering this this world um even though like you know zoraida had already written a star wars novel before but still yeah. this was this was different because this was like an entirely different you know the high republic is its own thing it's yeah. And there was the entire entirety of phase one that had already happened. And it's a lot of books and it's like a lot of um, stuff going on. So uh, a lot of catching up to do and everything. And uh, so, yeah, it was definitely a little stressful there. Like, you know, the stakes were very high. I didn't want to let anybody down. I didn't want to let down the people in Project Luminous who hired me. I didn't want to let down the fans. Um, 
And I didn't want to just let down myself. I was sort of like, you know, like this is such an important, like Star Wars is so important to me. And like, if I don't, if I do a crummy job, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll never forgive myself. So, so that's always been there as also just sort of this, um, little sort of voice in my head to try to like do better and do the best job you can and, and give it the, the best effort that you, that you possibly can, because that's what it deserves. So that's kind of where I was at when it all started. And now here I am and we're still going, which is pretty cool. Did you get to have one of those, you know, we've seen videos, you know, Project Luminous, I think it got announced in Chicago and everyone's like, yay, it's Project and no one knew what it was. No one would tell us what it was. And then in Anaheim, they were kind of full, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of people with them. But then at London, it was nuts, all the ACA or the High Republic stuff. But we got to see videos of like the original crew coming in and having like the brainstorming sessions at uh, Lucas or Skywalker Ranch. Did you get to get to do that with these other authors or anything like that? No, no, no. I was that was like well before I came on. And so that um, that had already happened. And I just God, I just I can't imagine what that must be must have been like to to be presenting and brainstorming and all that kind of stuff. So but um no, that, yeah, I wasn't there at the time. I, I like, again, I really stepped in for sort of phase two of the high Republic and um, yeah. there have been, uh, there's been a lot of brainstorming since then <laughs> and a lot of zoom meetings and a lot of very well, complicated documents. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, say that again. I haven't said you guys meet like every two weeks to talk about what's happening or something. Yeah. Like that. We have a scheduled zoom meeting every two weeks. Um, <laughs> And most like, you know, some of us can't be there, like somebody will be on a plane and they actually like can't can't be there or something like that. But um, yeah, we have the Zoom meeting, we get to check in with each other. And it's been really great because we get to hash out lots of details that need finessing. There's so much that needs to be finessing because there's so many characters and so many things going on. And um, I love I love it, though, because like, you know, like fixing problems or fixing problems before they become problems like um, and hashing all that stuff out is uh it's it's pretty neat to see the actual work being done i love it especially when it's not me when i get to sit back and be like you guys figure that out i'm gonna sit this one out because i'm not writing those characters <laughs> but um but yeah no it's cool it's very cool what was the collaboration like especially for phase two like did you and zoraida get to bounce ideas off each other or was it more like she wrote a thing and then kind of gave you stuff to work with or How'd that work so the, the crazy thing is that we were sort of writing simultaneously. I mean, she had a way head start. And so I, I kind of knew where her book was going. Um, but as you know, as you may know, when it comes to writing a book, um, there's multiple versions, right? And things change and storylines, like, oh my God, Cataclysm changed so many times. Like it, it just went through some really intense revision processes where I had to like fix things and add lines in here and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, so it was just like, it was kind of trying to write um, where your perspective was like a moving thing, you know, like it wasn't a fixed something. And so I was talking to, we were talking to George Mann a lot. We were talking to Zoraida and I were going back and forth. Cause I'd be like, well, I'm going to put this character in my book. And she's like, Oh, I have to like retrofit that into convergence. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Lydia. And I'd be like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so things like that would happen. Um, and then with Kevin and I, Cav and I were writing books that were taking place exactly at the same time. Only oh, his book was day. Yes. And mine was adult and he was like subterranean and I was like above ground on Dalna. And so we were doing things. And one of the, this huge mistake that I made was we had a conversation like way back when we were like, okay, it's going to be like this. And this is roughly what I'm going to do. And this is roughly what you're going to do. Good. Let's just go. And so we were like writing it and I'd written the entire book and it was getting really close to the end. And he was like, and then the floods are happening. And, and I'm like, what floods? I was like, what? What flood? And he goes, the rains. And I'm like, what rain? He goes, don't you remember? It's going to be pouring rain. There's going to be this like giant storm. And it's going to cause flooding and like the caverns and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, Kevin, I forgot about the floods. I forgot about the rain. And I had to rewrite the whole book with the uh, weather changing yeah. everything. It's a huge part of that story. It, like once they land. Massive. I know. Oh you like you probably you should have seen my face like i think i just like all the blood ran out of my face and i was like a lot of cuss words internally directed at myself i was just like how could i have forgotten that oh my god and then i had to rewrite the whole thing and make sure that i 
got the weather right and the weather ended the right way. But it was like, it actually made the book so much better because it's bad enough having to write a giant battle in the middle of the night. It's so much worse to have to go through it when it's raining. And that's, we just threw so many awful things at our characters. We were so mean to them. Yeah. I, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that, I can't even still, I'm still recovering from, uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I mean, I'm sorry, but I'm not that sorry. <laughs> I, think I, I think I tweeted, I, I called you the order 66 of phase two. <laughs> so. I know. I know. I think I was really funny. Cause like, I think when the acolyte was like, had come, was like about to come out, everybody was like, just beware. The high Republic is not really known for like saving like every life at the end of the book. <laughs> and people were like, Oh my God, everyone's <laughs> going to die. And it was sort of like a lot of people died. It was sort of like High Republic fans. You should be used to this by now. So yeah, it's part of the course. I wish I, wish I had me and Jimmy's messages because Jimmy messaged me that story you were saying earlier about when his wife was watching him. She's like, "What's wrong?" Jimmy messaged me literally saying, "She's killing everyone." Like, what? <laughs> what? What's Molly doing now? And he's like, "No, get this book now. She's killing everybody." And I, just listening to you then talking about the brainstorming session. I don't know why. I just got this vision of you walking in and everyone going, well, what's your idea then, Lydia? And you go, death, 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 death. <laughs> death. I know. Sort of like cross this out. Cross that one out. Cross this person out. Cross yeah. Out. Um, yeah. But yeah. But we do have conversations about like, can't should we be like not killing this many? Maybe you should like, you know, you know, should we be creating some red shirts so that like, <laughs> you know, whatever. So we don't get too attached to them. All that kind of stuff. So these conversations are all like, incredibly thought out and yeah. figured out and stuff like that. And we don't kill. It's like true. It it, yeah. Like when you read, a, if you read a story with like, you know, like legacy characters, you know, like you knew nothing was going to happen to Yoda or, you know, Yaddle, Yaddle and Yoda were fine, but you're like everybody yeah. else. I mean, it's fair game. No like and that just, I think that's one of the exciting things about the high Republic is there's yeah. you guys are creating it. And it's just, I mean, we you just don't know. Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, has there been a favorite thing for you to write? Like, I mean, is it the book? Is it the short stories? I mean, you know, or has it just all just been pretty awesome? I mean, because it sounds like it's been a fantastic experience for you, but is there anything that you're really excited or something you want to do? If you had a choice, they'll say, all right, you can do some more short stories, you can write another book. You know, which one would you pick, I guess? Oh, that's a good question. I would say. I would say book just because I know this sounds, this maybe doesn't make sense, but short stories are kind of tough to write sometimes. Like I was not, I did not become a writer using the short form. Like I, I just went straight into novel writing. And so I like having 300 pages to figure stuff out and to really let my characters grow and change. And so to do that in the short form is, is a, more of a struggle for me. I enjoy it very much. And now that I've done like a bunch of them, um, I'm, I feel like I, I have a little bit more of a handle on it, but they, they're, um, they're challenging in a different way. So I, I do like novels just because I like having the, uh, the time and space to, um, create these, um, these characters and like work on that world and, and, um, just basically take the readers on a on a big ride. So between the two, that's probably what I prefer. Just with the um, other authors as well, Lydia, how much have they leaned on you for like your medical knowledge? I know um, <laughs> Kevin said he's messaged you a few times as well for some of his work. So do you get a lot of the other authors to uh, ask for hints and tips about your medical knowledge? Um, I do. I do. It's it's it comes in super handy with my writing. And I've done that a lot with other people just sort of outside of Star Wars. Um, I have yeah. a lot of author friends who will be like, hey, I really need to injure my my character. <laughs> will you help me? <laughs> or I need to like pick a poison or I need to figure out like, you know, exactly how do you overdose somebody or, you know, yeah. what's the toxicity of this plant? You know, so I get a lot of questions about medically um manipulating situations and books and things like yeah. that so yeah I've, I've done that actually since i started writing so when i was like a really a novice writer one of the ways that i would help people my other fellow novice writers out is i would give them medical advice on scenes and stuff like that so um so that has come in very handy but in the in star wars it comes in handy as well so we have 
um, you know, talked about different things like how, um, you know, the blight would affect people and like the mechanism yeah. of that. And so we've, we've discussed that. And um, when it came to, um, you know, certain injuries and things like that, like, you know, what's a fatal wound and what's something that the medics can handle and all that kind of stuff. And you do have to make those sort of choices. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, it's come in handy for sure. I can remember reading Cataclysm with everyone dying and in the back of my mind going, she's a doctor. This is, this is actually what would happen. <laughs> like she understands. Yeah. they would die from this wound. They wouldn't die from this wound. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's interesting to go through. And I think it's also, I think readers or other authors who have had their own sort of like medical situations going on, will have a really unique perspective on what it's like when, um, when illness hits or when, you know, um, yeah. someone goes through physical traumas or mental traumas and things like that. So I try to be, um, cognizant of that when I'm when I'm writing, but without overdoing it and being like, I'm a doctor. Let me show you I'm a doctor, and I'm gonna like put all the stuff. Like I, I didn't. I never want it to. I never want to be heavy handed with it. Um, but you know, like um, like when Creighton breaks his like gets his leg broken. Um, yeah. in the book, I was like, I need to make this like really awful because it's, it's an awful thing to feel. It's an awful thing to experience. And, and it's hard to, it's hard to bring down a Jedi. So you got to do it in like a one, two, three, like multiple things that they just can't recover from aside from, you know, obviously like, you know, getting impaled in the chest or something like that. So, so yeah. So when I took like, for example, like when I took Creighton down, I had to make sure it was like multiple things. And like when, when I knew that I was going to do something with Ada, it wasn't, it couldn't be as simple as a oh, blaster hitter just down, you know, it had to be something that was so kind of traumatic for the reader because it's, you have to, these are, these are knights and masters. They are not, um, you know, young Jedi who can just, um, maybe are really good for a fight after a certain point where they just don't have the experience to sort of take it to the next level. Um, you have to be a little harder. <laughs> you have to be harder on the better Jedi to, to, to do bad things to them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I have a question for you too. Um, when you get to talk about the force, right? There's lots of talk about the force, you know, in the star Wars fandom and people understand it one way or the other way. When you when you talk about it, is it how you see it? I mean, how would you explain the Force to someone who doesn't know anything about Star Wars? <laughs> God, I mean, you explain it really well. Like, there's a couple times with like Oren Darga, he says some things you're like, oh man, like you know, and then some stuff like that that just really kind of hits home. And he's a he's an interesting character on his own. <laughs> I had so much fun writing him. He was great. Then, um, I don't know if you've listened. Mark Thompson brings him to life. You know, obviously in the audio books. And yes. Him, like, oh my God, he's amazing. Version. Yeah, he's Mark's quality. Yeah. He's so good. He's so good. So I know I'd like to meet him in in, uh, in person sometime. But um, so what was your question? I oh, totally you, forgot what your question was. Um, when you describe the force in your book, is that how oh, yeah. you see it? Like, is you know, or, I mean, because you said you got a lot of freedom, right? Is that so? Is that how you interpret the force for yourself? I think so. I think so. I think I have a very classic idea of what the force is and how it works. Um, and I did not really stray far beyond that. And there are, you know, within the universe, there are certain rules and there are certain creators that have tried to push those boundaries. Um, but I find that I'm not really one of them at, the, at least at this moment, like right now, I'm, I'm not, I, I, um, I'm a very classic sort of, um, when it comes to what the forest does, what it's capable of, um, and how people interpret it and how also, but remember this is how the Jedi and, and um, non-Jedi interpreted it at that time. So this is also like an historical context, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so yeah, it's pretty much, I mean, Yoda taught me everything I knew. So <laughs> it's kind of what he says is what goes for me, you know? <laughs> yeah. cool. Love it. So looking forward to the future of things going on in Star Wars, um, are you heading to Star Wars Celebration? Will we see you next year? I'm I'm hoping to. I haven't bought any tickets yet and I haven't like, I don't know where I'm staying or anything like that, but I Same. when <laughs> good, okay, I'm glad I'm not alone. But at the end of um at the end of Star Wars Celebration Europe, 
I remember being like, I will be going to Japan. It will be a once in a lifetime opportunity. It doesn't always, it's not always there. Um, I'm still writing actively um, in the Star Wars universe, you know, with the short stories. And so I was like, I have to try to go. And so I'm going to try. So hopefully I will see, are you guys going? Yep. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm not playing tickets yet, I'm going. Just, yeah, neither have I. Where I'm stopping. <laughs> So I will see. Uh, so hopefully I will see you guys there. I probably need to go buy plane tickets soon though, um, and figure out where the heck I'm staying. But I, I yeah, I think this one is definitely going to be one for the books. It's going to oh, be amazing. Oh, that's just the location. You can't beat that. Like, I know. Yeah, like, I go, know. Have you guys been to Japan before? Wait. No, that's one of the reasons my oh, wife and I let's go. Okay. Are you going to stay like a little bit longer so you get to actually mm -hmm. spend yeah. a little time there? A little bit. I mean. Uh, with being a teacher, I can't take a ton of time off, but I am going to mm -hmm. take a few days Same. and just, you know, research for class. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Write it off. Yeah. Before it's, it's a tax write off. Right. I'm super lucky yeah. because my school's spring break is always over Easter. Oh. So, and celebrations oh. over Easter. So I can just nice. take spring break. Oh, so. that's fantastic. That's so fantastic. So, yeah, I think I'm definitely going to have to. I, I will definitely be there. I'm so excited. I'm excited to see you guys. It'll be awesome. It'll be great. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait for it. Yeah. Same with me with, with my work. Uh, I've only got a few days. So I've got a day before, and then I think I've got two days after it finishes. Um, I've always wanted to go to Japan. Always <laughs> wanted to go to Japan. So I don't I don't plan on sleeping on the last two days. So I can just sleep <laughs> on the way home, if I'm honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the great thing about going to a foreign country is that, like, you don't have to see all of it. Even if you stay in one area, but you just get to know the area really well, like, you will have had a great experience. And yeah. there's going to be, it's just going to be amazing. <laughs> I've been there alone is worth it. Yeah, it'll be worth it. Even if it's an extra one day, it'll still be worth it. Yeah, 100%. Um, I've sort of got three questions. I'm going off the script a little bit now. So okay. <laughs> the first question that sort of just popped into my head is, is there a character that you've not wrote about that you want to or wish you could write about? Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. I don't know that I can answer that. I feel like there are people that I would have loved to have written about, but like they've, it's already been done. So I'm kind of like, mm, can't, yeah. can't do that. Like, you know, a young okay. Leia or, um, um, you know, young Queen Amidala. Like I, I do sort of find myself um, attracted to writing uh, female centric characters. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, like I think in a lot of those, a lot of the, um, the, those characters in the movies, I, I find myself like really wanting to, to explore them a little bit more, but no, I don't think I could pick one, like not right off the top of my head. So. Okay. Next one, very similar question is, and this is for any uh, book that's already out. Is, is there a book that you've read or looked at and gone, I wish I'd wrote that one or wish I'd had the chance to write that? No. <laughs> oh God. Um, probably I kind of wish Oh, I feel like this is such a like silly answer. I I kind of in the High Republic, I wish I had written um, Light of the Jedi. <laughs> and I think it's because it's maybe one of my favorite books. And yeah. I would like just I tr I like to try to imagine what it would have been like to have been in that process of like imagining what, what had to be done. Um, with the hyperspace disaster and how I would have tackled it. And I really I think I just think the challenge would have been an extraordinary experience and i wonder like would it have come out the same would they how different would it have been so but that's one that i i just because it's what it's probably one of my favorite high republic goods because it's the one that just got me like completely invested in the world and everything um let me see um I would love to have taken a shot at Bloodline by Claudia Gray because I love politics and books. And if you read Cataclysm, nice. you'll see there's a lot of politics yes. in that. In that, and I and I I I think there are other people who are like this book is about politics. It's like you know maybe it's not my thing. I was expecting more of this and that. And I'm like I love that stuff because I love that um, just all the machinations behind the scenes about how things happen and yeah. you know. Um, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I would have loved to, that would have been fun to do, I think, but. Nice. Yeah. A much easier question now, promise. Okay, thank uh, you. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what projects 
do you currently have coming out or working on um, that you're okay to tell us about? If there isn't anything that you're not okay to tell us about, that's totally fine as well. Is there anything that you're sure. working on? Um, I'm working on a couple of proposals, so I can't tell you about any of those right now. Um, cool. I have it's, two books coming out. What's that? Adventures of Yaddle, maybe? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you anything. I, I'm just, my lips are sealed. And then um, I do have two books coming out next year that are non-Star yeah. Wars books. So Ooh. as you guys um, may know, I write uh, nonfiction as well. And so we have a book that's called, um, I'm co-writing with um, my friend, Nate Peterson, and it's called Pseudoscience. So it's kind of like a funny um, uh, book that's very similar to Quackery, but um, this time we are talking about things like flat earth and lie detector tests and all these other things that um, we kind of debunk superstitions, other stuff like that. So it's, it's nice. going to be fun. Bigfoot. Of course, if you believe in Bigfoot, you're going to yell at me, but um, <laughs> like cryptids, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So that book is coming out, I think in like March of next year. And then perfect the timing for the flight to Japan. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then um, we have, I have another book that's coming out in the fall. So about a year from now, and it's young adult, it's called K Jane. And it's about a young Korean American teenager in Omaha, Nebraska, of all places, who feels like she's not Korean enough. And so she sets out um, trying to educate herself to be a better Korean by teaching herself <laughs> all the things about Korean culture that she doesn't know, like K-pop and K-dramas and K-beauty and food and all that kind of stuff. So that one's called K-Jane. It's coming out in the fall with Quill Tree Books. Wow. Awesome. Next yep. year. Next year in like a whole year. So. Very cool. Wow. Because you had just gone to Korea, right? I remember following you on Instagram. I and did. Taking your daughter, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And I just that, went to Korea. Inspiration for the book, or I mean, it I was, was. You know, I have been thinking about this book for years. For like, no joke, like five or six years, I've been thinking about this book, and I finally got to write it, and I finally sold it. So I'm really excited. It's very near and dear to my heart. It's a very personal book um, because, as a Korean American, I just oftentimes like early on in my young adult as a young adult author i felt like i just wasn't as korean as some of the other authors around like i just i don't know i just didn't have the right like sort of korean american card to flash as other people for various reasons we all grew up differently and so i, I it was really nice to be able to sort of like um to to tackle that subject so i um that was fun and then yeah i did get to go to korea last year which was incredible and i'm hoping to do it again um just for fun so this may be quite an international year for me we'll see very cool yeah well, lydia i cannot thank you enough for coming on and giving us a little insight to what must be you know your crazy life as far as busy life <laughs> creative life i mean just um, we're all huge fans um where can people find you on social media if they don't already follow you um, probably I'm most active really on, um, Instagram. So, uh, Lydia Kang, and then I'm also on threads. Um, that's sort of, I'm, I've kind of left X. I'm just not really, there. I like check in, but I don't do anything there, but I'm not really there anymore. Um, and I'm like really not great on Facebook. So those are probably my two biggest places. Um, my website is LydiaKang.com. I have a newsletter where I will just put out, I don't spam people. So I maybe put out a newsletter once a month, maybe it, more like every other month where I just sort of give updates about what's going on in my life. And um, yeah, but I'm, <clears throat> I'm pretty friendly. Won't bite your head off and you're welcome <laughs> to sort of like, just say hi to me on, on social media. I'm around. But we'll kill your favorite characters. <laughs> <laughs> I know I should wear that as a t-shirt, right? Very nice. Might kill your favorite characters. <laughs> well, it was well, really great to yeah. get to know you guys too. I learned a lot about Honestly. you guys as well. <laughs> absolutely fantastic again we super super appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us on the podcast massive thank you for myself marie jimmy the fans the listeners everyone that's listening is going to lose their mind um before we wrap it up we always finish off with like a little saying or a little motto whether it's may the force be with you or never tell me the odds whatever it is so we'll give you a little bit of time uh, just to think of one will come to you shortly um but for myself and we'll go to marie then we'll come to you Lisa. So for myself uh, for light and life from Marie. I was going to say for light and life. You took it from me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got one, Lydia? For light and life is my automatic go-to. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. awesome. 
All right. Well, Dr. Lydia King, thank you again. We can't can't wait to see what I know. We still got inside Star Wars insider stuff going on. I got yep. Yep. gun them. I'm, I'm you know very anxious for 227 to come out here shortly. But yep. for all of us, we have spoken. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.